Professor David Miller is a British sociologist whose research and publications focus on Islamophobia and propaganda. In 2021, he was accused of anti-Semitism at the University of Bristol for his anti-Zionist views, and in October 2021, he was sacked from the university. Now, earlier this month, on 5th February, an employment tribunal found that Professor Miller was unfairly dismissed and subjected to discrimination because of his anti-Zionist beliefs, which qualified as a philosophical belief and is protected under pursuant to Section 10 of Equality Law 2010. It is my honor to have the company of Professor Miller today on Open Conversations with Sakina Datu. Thank you so much, Professor, for speaking to me. It's a pleasure. So let's just start uh, straight away with why were you sacked from the university? Well, there's a complicated question. So the university said in its public statement that I'd been sacked because I had uh, not reached the professional standards required at the university, but they didn't say anything more than that. Now, of course, I knew that they had found me not guilty of any anti-Semitism at all after a QC had done, an external QC had done an investigation. But the letter which they sent me to sack me, uh, 54 pages long, said that the reason that they sacked me was because uh, some students had felt offended and upset by the anti-Zionist things that I had said. And that's what they said was the real reason I was sacked. But they didn't make that public. But then what happened was that in the tribunal, the university's own witnesses admitted that that wasn't the real reason. <laughs> Actually, the real reason I'd been sacked was because I had expressed anti-Zionist views, which they felt were challenging and therefore enough to sack someone. So that was the, the university's own witnesses uh, contradicted their own case and effectively they destroyed their own case and it was revealed that the real reason I was sacked was not because I upset some students but because of, I was an anti-Zionist. I mean, that was extraordinary. Yeah. And, and this is quite common, isn't it, within the academic circles whereby uh, any person who speaks a about uh, anti-Zionism is subjected. Well, that's right. I mean, it's, uh, my case is not uh, the only case. There are many, many other cases in British universities. Uh, more recently, most recently, we've had uh, cases like the case of Shahad Abu Salama, who uh, was a Palestinian woman who was uh, who was, uh, was attacked and uh, um, has is currently taking her own uh, legal case. But of course, there are many, very many cases in the U.S. as well. I mean, we've seen going back very many years, a guy called Stephen Salaita, who was an academic and was denied a position, and he's now driving a school bus. Uh, of course, there's a famous case of Norman Finkelstein, and many others, uh, uh, too, too many to name, really. So now what are the implications of what the Employment Tribunal ruled because it's been seen as monumental and a step forward? What, what does it mean? Well, the, the, the press, the mainstream press referred to it as a landmark case, and I think that's just about correct. What it means is that uh, henceforth people cannot be sacked for being anti-Zionists. And, it, and uh, universities and indeed employers all over the country have to get their heads around the idea that anti-Zionist views are in the, in the law worthy of respect in a democratic society, which means that they're perfectly respectable views, they have nothing to do with racism, and, and that mean, uh, will form a precedent for cases going forward. That's the first thing. And the second thing, of course, is that more widely than just the uh, question of employment law, is that it drives a coach and horses through the Israeli government's talking point, which is that anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are the same thing, which is a case they've been trying to make for 50 years or so. And it's very difficult for them to make that now when it's been established in law that they're not the same thing. And so that will be part of a, of a pushback against the Israeli attempt to confine all criticism of Israel to uh, mild and inoffensive terms. Uh, and it, it, it will be the beginning, I think, of the, of the end of the, the victory of Zionism in the public sphere. Mm. And I think it provides a lot of freedom to a lot of us also in different fields to be able to express ourselves more freely. Now, I, I want to pick on <coughs> some of your statements, you know, those which can go to your sect. Um, you had said that there is a Zionist network operating in Britain. What does that mean? Well, look, uh, the, people talk about the Israel lobby, and I suppose people in America or in the UK know that there are Israel lobby groups. There's Labour Friends of Israel, there's Conservative Friends of Israel. People sort of have a vague sense that, that those are Israel lobby groups. But the, uh, the Zionist movement is much broader than just the, uh, the groups which engage in policy discussion. There are, of course, think tanks, mm -hmm. 
push it, which pu push Islamophobic ideas, which are largely Zionist. And then, of course, there's the Zionist movement itself. And the Zionist movement is a, a much broader thing. It's, of course, headquartered uh, in Israel, uh, um, uh, the, the main organization which runs all of the Zionist movement all over the world. It's called the World Zionist Organization. So it gives you a bit of a clue yeah. what it does uh, in its title. And it, it has its own uh, affiliates in the UK through the Zionist Federation, which has about 40 members, through the Jewish National Fund, which is involved in Palestine and stealing Palestinian land, and in, indeed through the United Jewish Israel Appeal, the biggest uh, fundraiser for Israel in this country. And they are all engaged in trying to uh, promote the idea that it's legitimate to, um, to remove the Palestinians from, from what's called Israel, uh, uh, and indeed for there to be such a thing as a Jewish state. So that it's a, a much broader movement than, than people perhaps understand. I've mm -hmm. calculated this uh, with some research that I've done, and it seems to me that a conservative estimate is that there are probably more than 2,000 Zionist organizations in the UK. So that's a very wow. uh, w widespread network. And these are groups which all are doing the, the same thing. They're all mm -hmm. pushing towards the idea of excusing what's happening uh, in Gaza and the genocide there. And these are, these are genocide denial organizations, all of them. And so mm -hmm. there's a need to think properly about um, how, how we deal with that question, yeah. how we deal with the racism which is inherent in the operation of these organizations. And it's so important, I think, you know, f coming from an academic uh, perspective, because for a lot of us, when we kind of mention that, it's always seen as some sort of a propaganda. But you've established that through your academic research. Now, the other issue I am quite interested in is I think there is, uh, you've said a lot of uh, interfaith events are also sponsored by Zionists. And this is specifically to sell Zionism to Muslims, which is a subject I'm quite interested in. Um, how does that happen? Well, so there, there are very many interfaith organizations. Um, quite a lot of them are, are set up by Zionists. I mean, you know, not, not just uh, sort of, uh, Jews and Muslims coming together, but mm -hmm. actually Zionists is a group uh, which was set up by the Board of Deputies uh, of British Jews. Uh, and it then works with, with uh, Muslims who will work with them mm -hmm. to try and normalize Zionism in the Muslim community. And they, they, they think that the Muslim th community is a threat because, of course, the Muslim community was very important in the mm -hmm. movement against the Iraq war in 2003. And so there's an attempt to, to draw the sting of the Muslim community and to, to stop them being so anti-war and so pro-Palestine. And they do that by uh, pretending that um, Muslims and Jews getting together to cook chicken soup will somehow uh, deal with the divisions that there are over the question of Zionism and will divert attention from the question of Zionism. Now, these are actual Zionist groups and organizations, including going into mosques, including uh, in a famous case, the East London Mosque, which you perhaps yeah. wouldn't have expected. Yeah. Uh, and these are organizations which are led by Zionists, and they, and they all they pretend, they throw up their hands in horror, and say, oh, we're just doing nice things, we're just cooking chicken soup, we're being nice to the Muslims, what's wrong with that? But actually, of course, what they're trying to do is to make sure that Muslims cannot in the future criticize Zionism. Is that, I mean, wa is widespread? C can we say that there are genuine interfaith uh, events that happen that, you know, is just trying to bring Muslims and Jews together? Are you talking a big percentage being led by Zionists? Well, I mean, so Nisa Nishim is a, is a, a, a women's group. That, that's a Zionist organization. Mitzvah Day, uh, also a Zionist organization. Most of the interfaith groups which are funded by, for example, the British government, and many of the Zionist groups are themselves funded by the British government, are, are, are Zionist influenced or come from, Zi from Zionist origins. So uh, the, the, I, I'm not aware really of any significant ones which are not, uh, mm. uh, have, have that, don't have that kind of pedigree. Maybe there are small local ones, but the, the national ones by and large are, are come from a Zionist pedigree. Wow. Okay, you also said I don't teach conspiracy theories of any sort, and that is it's simply a matter of fact that parts of Zionist movements are involved in funding Islamophobia. Mm. Tell me more about that. Well, this is one of the insights which I think most worried the Zionist movement. That we did some work back in, I don't know, 2010 or 11 on uh, Islamophobic think tanks. So on the policy exchange, on what was then called the Centre for Social Cohesion, which became the Henry Jackson Society. And we looked at where the funding of these organisations was coming from, to the extent that we could, because they're a bit secretive. And w what we discovered was that many of the largest fun funders that we were able to, to, to find out about, we didn't know what they were. They were, they were charities, uh, and they often were named after a particular person, a memorial charity or something. And so we looked at what else they funded, and we fund found that they tended to also fund, uh, directly fund settlements in Palestine. 
the IDF, and sometimes Jewish supremacist groups. And so we concluded mm -hmm. that these groups, which were funding Islamophobia, were actually Zionist organizations. And that, of course, led us to do much more research on, on Zionist family foundations and the, mm -hmm. on the funding of Islamophobia, and also, of course, directly on the funding of settlements and, and of the IDF. Very interesting. Now, just moving track a bit um, into, into Labour Party. Now, I know that uh, you were initially uh, suspended. Later on, you resigned. Of course, we have Keir Starmer, who is an open Zionist. Um, what really is the issue with the Labour Party? Why did you resign? Well, uh, th that's a complicated process. I was, sub I was um, suspended uh, when uh, the first coup uh, was attempted against Corbyn, and then, then I was re re I was unsuspended after, uh, after the, the he'd won the, uh, the, the leadership again, uh, because, of course, they'd stopped me from voting. And then later on, they tried to to suspend me and ask me some questions. And I resigned before I was going to be suspended. It wasn't, that was neither of them were actually to do with, uh, with allegations of anti-Semitism. But nevertheless, it was, uh, it was clear by that stage that, that the possibility of making change with Jeremy Corbyn at, at the head of the party was something which was running into the sand and wasn't going to make any difference. Now, what we said at the time was that, uh, you know, the, the, the problem was that that, um, that Jeremy, uh, as leader of the party, uh, and his advisers had advised him to take this approach of, of um, apologising whenever there were allegations of anti-Semitism and saying he was terribly sorry. He knew that anti-Semitism was a real issue and we really had to target, uh, t target anti-Semitism. And if we just apologise and move on, the advisers said to him, then, then it will blow over. And of course, mm -hmm. it, it didn't blow over. Now, I had a different idea, which was that actually, you know, that we're being attacked by racist Zionists and we need to fight them. And Zionism is a racist ideology, intrinsically racist and has to be defeated, just like uh, any other form of racism. And so what we have to do is to, is to fight, to stand and fight and say, no, Zionism is racism, Zionism is intrinsically genocidal and it has to be ended. And that, that really caused consternation. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't like me saying that. And indeed, the university thought that saying things like that was just too much for someone who was in an, an academic position, and that's uh, why, why they fired me. Of course, now this judgment has come mm -hmm. to say, no, anti-Zionist views of that sort are perfectly respectable, as, mm -hmm. as of course we always knew, but it's now been declared by the courts. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of uh, staying with the Labour Party, I think this is a big issue right now, especially within the Muslim community, who are talking about uh, you know, boycotting uh, Labour. Uh, what uh, do, do you think that that's a strategy that is uh, good or that it it has value um, for people to withhold their votes from both the Conservatives and the Labour Party? What are the implications of that? Well, I mean, the Labour Party is um, up to its neck in complicity with the genocide in Gaza. I mean, the, 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 there's been a new case, hasn't there, of the uh, ex-Israeli intelligence officer working uh, in, in social media in the Labour Party. And of course, just the other day, the, in the Kingswood by-election, the new MP's husband, it turns out, uh, it was a recruiter for Unit 8200, which is an Israeli intelligence mm -hmm. organisation. I mean, you could, ha you could hardly have a more blatant connection there to, to the genocide. But the, so the question is, well, what, what do you do? And this is, was always the question before in 2003 with the Iraq war with the rise of the Respect Party in Scotland, with the rise of the S Scottish Socialist Party, what should we do? Mm -hmm. And in 2003, what happened in Scotland at the Scottish Parliament elections was that a quarter of the MSPs, members of the Scottish Parliament who were elected at that stage, were anti-war uh, MSPs, six Socialists, seven Greens, and that's a quarter of the whole Parliament. And so that really made a difference. And of course, this is what we uh, hope and expect and that might happen again, it, it, that uh, independent candidates, uh, anti-war candidates, George Galloway, of course, standing in Rochdale, and many other candidates, possibly Starmer himself being challenged mm -hmm. in his own constituency. I mean, there, there is no alternative, really, is there? I mean, both of the main parties are squarely behind the genocide in Gaza, won't say anything, uh, uh, even remotely critical mm -hmm. of, of the genocide and what's happening. And so the people of this country, if they want to have any voice, need to make alternative arrangements with their votes. And that means, of course, voting for alternative candidates. Mm. And these are independent candidates mostly, I guess? These will be mostly independent candidates. Some will, some will be like George's, for example, in the Workers' Party, but there are other parties ab about, and, uh, uh, mm. uh, some of the, and some of those will be independent candidates. But mm. whoever it is that uh, is raising the issue of genocide, then people should vote for them. Now, we've been seeing uh, 
really horrifying uh, genocide taking place, and we've all been watching it. Um, I don't think anyone can say that uh, there's anything positive as such coming out of that, yet there is a positive. I mean, how much do you think the landscape has changed around the world, but also particularly in Britain, um, in terms of people's views and understanding of the whole conflict? Well, I mean, <coughs> the, with the genocide in Gaza, the, the mask of the Zionists has slipped. So millions and millions of people around the world now yes. see the genocidal nature of Zionism in a way which they didn't before. And that is a challenge to the Zionists. Of course, it doesn't mean that uh, the British government or the US government have stopped their complicity uh, uh, and their involvement, but nevertheless, it will have an effect on politics here, but also on the direct action that people take. So pe people are understanding now much more how, why it's important to boycott uh, Israel and to boycott those organizations which are sending money directly to the to the IDF uh, as we speak, yeah. including British charities, incidentally. Mm -hmm. And so, and so there's a there's that kind of pressure is going to build on the Zionists. And what you you will see, I think, is that this is the people have been saying this, I think, for a, for a number of months now. That this is really the beginning of the end of Zionism. It cannot mm -hmm. it cannot continue with the activities that it's currently engaged in and hope to survive at the end of this. And what it, the way it hopes to get out of this is get out of jail free card is that it hopes to provoke on the northern border with Hezbollah mm -hmm. and in doing so to drag the US into direct conflict. They think if they have the US on their side that they will win and they can, ex and they, they can expand. They want to form a greater Israel, they want to go into Lebanon, they want to go into Syria, mm -hmm. they want to go into Jordan, they want to have ev even up to Turkey and across uh, uh, part of Iraq, they want to create a, a, a greater Israel. It's like this is an imperialist project. Mm -hmm. And people need to begin to understand that in order to turn it back. And the final question is, is there any justification at this stage for anyone to be scared of speaking against Zionism? No, I mean, this is, this is the beauty of my case. I mean, that, uh, that we've established the principle that it's perfectly legitimate, that it is, to, to quote the law, it is worthy of respect in a democratic society to voice anti-Zionist views. And the anti-Zionist views I've, uh, I, I've voiced are, are not... Um, you know, mild anti-Zionist views. These are full-throated anti-Zionist views which call for the end of Zionism and the dismantling of the apartheid state uh, and of the Jewish state. And so uh, people can be confident that they can say all that kind of stuff and not be accused of racism and not be sacked for it because it's now been established in law that that's the case. Thank you so much, uh, Professor David Miller. And thank you for watching. If you can, please do subscribe to my channel where I will be bringing you enlightening interviews. Goodbye.